So if you have a Bible with you, you can turn again to Psalm 42, although it will be uh, on the screen in a little bit. Uh, well, we'll read it together, <clears throat> but you might want to refer to your own copy and your own version. Everybody have a good night, some good sleep, ready to go? Good. <laughs> Well, yesterday we left off having only begun to look at Psalm 42, 43. As we said, they actually originally uh, go together. Same theme, same construction, grammar, all that sort of thing. The first of the Psalms of the sons of Korah. These Psalms that we're examining this week together, all written by the Levitical musician priests, the Korahites. And so now today we want to pick this up again and dig out a few more very important truths that I hope to bring to you if we want to actually be honest with God, to pour out our hearts in honesty and openness and authenticity uh, to the Lord our Creator. Uh, there are some really important ideas in this psalm that we'll again tackle today. So the text is up here, and uh, to get it all in one slide or two, it's a bit small, but can you read that? I think there's something about um, reading it collectively together that just sort of embeds it in your heart, in your spirit. So I'd like to ask you to just read it with me, and we'll read it together and let it kind of minister to us just the reading of these powerful words themselves. All right? We'll see the age of people by how they're squinting, Janet. <laughs> In honor of God's word, why don't you just stand with me and we'll read it together. <clears throat> From the very beginning, Psalm 42, 43, together, for the choir director, a masquil of the sons of Korah, as the deer pants for the water, so so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng, and lead them in procession to the house of God, with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, for the help of his presence. O my God, my soul is in despair within me, Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound, the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? <clears throat> why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. 
then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and upon the lyre I shall praise you, God my God. Why are you in despair, O my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You can be seated. The Hebrew uh, tradition groups this first set of Korahite psalms as particularly psalms of pilgrimage. Pilgrimage as the faithful ones of the remnant people made their way often very long distances to the temple to worship. And they are meant to deliberately suggest not a static faith like a relationship with God that is stuck. Anybody stuck? This is for pilgrims who are moving but a moving, growing, advancing faith. Psalms of pilgrimage, like a relationship with God that is maturing. This is who these psalms are for. We gave attention yesterday to the prevailing poetic metaphor in this psalm. What was it, the metaphor, the one prevailing metaphor? Water. Noting first how it is depicting God himself as water, very much living, the living God, as it says in verse 2. My soul thirsts for God, the living God, like water it is alive and full of activity, meaning active and involved God is, both in our personal lives particularly, and in the world around us generally. And I want to pick up on that idea again this morning and then add a few other very critical bits of uh, really truth encounter, uh, encountering truth in these powerful poetic words of Psalm 42, 43. This reference to God as water is all the more direct when we now move to verse 7. Again, keep your finger in the text or your eye upon the screen as it may be. Verse 7, as the psalm refers to your, in reference to God of course, your waterfalls, your breakers and waves. Now, it could be evocative of a sense of being submerged, as though you are so overwhelmed by God that it has the sensation actually of drowning, which, by the way, in the New Testament takes hold of that in the sacramental picture of baptism, to be submerged and and losing your life, drowning, as Paul says, do you not know that when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ's death so that you might rise again to new life, submerged? And many scholars believe it's re evoking even this psalm, the waters coming over you. But it is even more likely a figurative sense of being swept over as the end of verse 7 says, rolled over. It's a visual scene of the power of water. You know, when you see waves crashing at the ocean beaches and waterfalls and massive amounts of water coming over a mountain or a cliff, it reminds the poet of the powerful qualities of our God, of God the Creator. The language of breakers, mishbar is the Hebrew word, and the waves, gal in Hebrew. Verse 7, 
is obviously evoking inspired imaginings of the immensity and the ferocity even of the ocean itself. You stand on a beach like I do and watch the waves of the ocean and it just speaks of power and strength and, and God or a waterfall. And even beyond that, as we see in verse 7, again, keep your eye in verse 7, these scenes particularly invoke the sound, more than likely the roar of the water and both waterfalls and the crashing waves of the sea. Sometimes that sound is just like an immense roar, isn't it? so powerfully recreating then both a visual and especially for musicians, Levitical Korahite priests, an audio awareness of the awesome power of God to remind us he is living, he is active. And then verse 8, skip now down to verse 8 unites this awareness of the awesome power of God with two specific ways that God's power is applied in human experience. That is your experience, mine. Via the verb direct or better command in verse 8, the Lord will direct, some versions say, or command his loving kindness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night. The word love or loving kindness is the Hebrew word chesed, which is so freighted across both testaments with so much about our appreciation of what grace is. Loving kindness is chesed. It is the unmerited, undeserved, unearned love of God, grace. And of course, the song of the night is that eruption of praise that cannot be controlled by timeliness. It's so part of your heart and soul that it awakes you in the night with an eruption of praise. The one in the daytime, as verse 8 specifies, is the public display of God's grace all around us. And the other in the nighttime, of course, is the personal, the private, the uncontainable, untimely quality of praise. I recall when my mom remarried, my father died at quite a young age of a heart disease. I was 26 years old when my father died, a great man of God, a missionary doctor. My mom then remarried and at her wedding afterwards, in fact it was I married her, I married my mother. This is my very first wedding as a pastor. I married my mom, I started the service that way. This is a unique occasion. This is my very first wedding and I'm marrying my mom. <laughs> Afterwards, we had quite a celebration at our home and one of their dear friends, my mom and her new husband, uh, a doctor named Millard Postma, we were up there singing and he runs out to the car he had parked out in the street and I kind of followed him to make sure he was okay and out of the back of his car he hauls out an auto harp and I said you just kind of carry an auto harp with you <laughs> and he said this was his words yes you never know when praise might break out <laughs> that's this that eruption of praise in the middle of the night private, alone, nobody to be impressed with your worship, it's just you and God. One, one of my 
problems with a lot of our worship around us today is that it's, it's really kind of a public display that draws attention to me rather than private times with God as well. Here, the poet's idea is that just as God is in command of the roar of the waterfalls and the power of the waves of the sea, so he is the one who commands or directs that the most public avenue of the expression of himself in the world is none other than chesed, grace, loving kindness. God displays himself preeminently in his character of grace, which is all of what Jesus is about the grace of God. You don't earn Jesus' death for you. It's just a gift. And just as he is the one who is actually behind, directing, commanding the personal, private, uncontainable praise like a song in the night that no one else is privy to but you and God. I'm going to pray for us this week that your sleep, little as it is, be interrupted by a burst of praise. You wake up two in the morning just having to sing Haydn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And so it is not surprising that the poet ends verse 8. Look at the end of verse 8 by referring to God as the God of my life. For in the very same manner that without water I will surely die. You know, you can go what? 40, 50 days or more without food. But how long does a human being survive without water? Three or four days, maybe five days, something like that. It's the very same manner as that without water, I will surely got, die. So my relationship with God, my passion, I'm a Korahite, I'm a Levitical musician priest. Without God, there is no life for he is the God of my life. So that what the sons of Korah are wanting to convey is that level of passion we talked about yesterday, that level of passion, the proper perspective on reality which real faithful pilgrims advancing in their faith maintain that apart from God, apart from God, I cannot truly live. Just as surely as I cannot survive apart from water. He is the God who brings me life. And many scholars believe Jesus had this text in mind when he said, I will give you life abundantly. Not just physical, but life that is rich and full and meaningful and purposeful, even in the midst of the hardest, most difficult, suffering times. The God of my life. So the Korahites would say, my life is a prayer to the God of my life. I really want to urge you today to enter your music training, your rehearsals, your practice as a prayer expression. Okay, can you play today making it an expression of prayer? Can you study? Can you work hard? Do the hard work 
but through an expression of prayer, a prayer to the God of my life. Well, not only does the poet allude to God as water in this powerful psalm, but the psalm also is quite obviously correlating the soul, that is yourself, in terms of water. As we go back to verse, verses 1 and 2, so reflect there in your own Bibles or on the screen, where they clearly infer this water imagery with reference to the thirsty soul. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The soul is the Hebrew nefesh. Soul is one of those terms in our churches and especially in our evangelical tradition that's kind of tossed around with, you know, how is my soul? It is well with my soul. But what do we really mean by that? What does the Bible mean? Nefesh. It's a Hebrew idiom, actually. It's part of a Hebraic idiom, my soul or your soul. And it's no, about, no doubt best understood as referring to the whole person, from brain to heart to body to psyche to emotion, so all that makes you uniquely you is your soul. It's not just some ethereal thing that floats away to heaven. It's part of your material existence in Hebrew. So the psalm is depicting, I want to suggest to you, a complete holistic longing like thirst for God. My soul pants, thirsts for the living God. That is a thirst for God that is equally an expression of the intellect, the emotions, the psyche, and even the body. All of which I really think Levitical priestly musicians Hone. To be a good musician and especially a priestly musician, especially, especially a Levitical, godly, serving the world musician for God's honor and glory musician, you must hone not just notes on a page or in your fingers, but you have to hone your intellect. You have to hone your emotions. You have to hone your psyche, and you even have to hone your body. Some people are quite critical of musicians who really get into it with their body. I don't. I think it's great. I, I love watching Bethany. She really, you know, just amazes me. And of course, it's coupled with incredible expertise. So, um, or Anne, many of us here. The body is part of that. You, how can you play with passion and just kind of do your little thing? No, you get your body combined with your brain and your emotion and your psyche. Musicians know this and hone it because these are Korahites. They're not just the sons of Asaph, they're the sons of Korah, musicians. All of me. That's the point, all of me, the whole of me, my soul has a deep craving for God like the sense of thirst. Is that where you are at this week, this summer? Craving God with the whole of your person, your soul. But it is precisely here that the soul awareness that is so evident in this psalm is such a model of that honesty with God that we spoke of yesterday and is really at the heart of all the psalms. For as we move through the poem, it is clearly, as we come later, 
an expression of a soul that is quite troubled, deeply troubled as we come to it in verse 5. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why are you in despair, the whole of me? And remember, this is the cry of this very one who is so evidently passionate for God that she or he can refer to it as panting for the living God. And it is repeated again in verse 6. And then yet again in verse 11. Excuse me. And yet again in 43 verse 5. Four times throughout this one really collective psalm. Four times the heart cry of this soul. Why are you in despair? Why are you disturbed? Now, some preachers would tackle this by saying, yeah, you shouldn't be in despair. Goes on to say hope in God. But I don't think that's the point of the Korahites at all. It is, in fact, an affirmation of what we might refer to, certainly what I would refer to as the spirituality, the maturing faith, the pilgrim faith, of soul despair, which actually contradicts the really silly notion that spirituality is logically at odds with seasons of despair in your life, but rather affirms that even the depths of soul crying, soul anguish, can be the experience of the person who is most passionate for God. Don't believe a lie that if you're experiencing soul despair, that means you're out of touch with God. You might be in the closest time with God. And it comes to a head at verse 6, which adds to it the emotive energy of a vocative cry at the beginning, which sets it apart. Elohe, Elohe. The same cry of Jesus from the cross. Oh my God. Why have you forsaken me? Verse 6. Oh my God. And not coincidentally this ex expresses the central cry of the poet. Oh my God. My soul is in despair within me. Have you... Young men and women, have you, faculty, you staff, counselors, ever been there? Are you there now? When the deepest expression of your soul, the most passionate cry to God from a heart true before him can be summed up with one vocative cry. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I want to encourage you, if that's you, that is like Jesus himself. My God, why have you forsaken me from the cross and the redemptive work of Christ for you? Me, the whole of me, my emotions, my intellect, my psyche, even my body, is so disturbed to such a degree that those who might ridicule, those who scoff at the life of faith might say, where is your God? Where is your God? 
verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Not once in this psalm, but twice that question is asked. In verse 10 as well, Where is your God? This at least in part, I think, explains the passion of these sons of Korda. That they are unafraid in their relationship with God, to be honest, to deal even with the most penetrating, most vulnerable, most transparent of questions. Where is God? Where is your God when your life is kind of ripped up? I, some of you know we work with refugees, asylum seekers, all Muslim background people coming to the cities of Europe. And, and they've come through just horrific uh, trauma. The women who come out of Iran who escape, they have to pay a smuggler. And there are three weeks or so, two to three weeks, traveling hidden in the back of a lorry under truck, under tramp, uh, uh, various coverings. And they're at the mercy of a male um, smuggler. And they know what they will face, and they do face it. Their bodies are taken advantage of and abused. The price of freedom, they step into that. They come, and through that experience, they arrive in a community like we have, and their question is, where is God? And happily, they do you find an answer to that question? One of the greatest compliments we receive in our church called the Upper Room, quite often, especially women, will say to me or my wife, the reason we're here is we feel safe. We feel safe. I think that's God meeting them, not me or my wife. It explains the passion of these sons of Korah, that they aren't afraid to deal with the hardest, most penetrating, the most transparent, the most vulnerable, honest questions, like, where is your God? And so I want to invite you into this same passionate theological honesty by asking you to ponder that question throughout this day throughout the practice and the study and the interaction and the camaraderie and are over the food and with one another and all the activities of this day, I ask you to ask a hard Korahite, Levitical, priestly question. Where is your God? Where is your God in your theology? Where is your God in your understanding of Scripture? Where is your God in your emotional requirements? Where is your God in your loyalties? Where is your God in your vision, in your purpose, in your future? Where is your God when uh, your life is a bit ripped up and tattered? Ask that question today, and I promise you this is a little cliffhanger. <laughs> Tomorrow, there will be an answer from the sons of Korda. But just be brave and ask the question today. And tomorrow we'll come to some Bible-focused answer that is there. 
Lord, I thank you so much for these dear young men and women. Thank you for their passions, for their hearts, their love of music, their love of you, their love of one another. And I'm sorry for the bad teaching and preaching and theology that has so infected so many of us that we think soul questions and despair are at odds with growth in you. And I pray you'd challenge that today and allow each of us to say and honestly address, where is your God today? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.